Dr. Becky Carmichael, who is our featured speaker today. Um, Dr. Carmichael is a speaker coach for TEDx LSU and the LSU Communication Across the Curriculum Coordinator for the College of Science and the College of the Coast and Environment. So thank you for being here, Dr. Carmichael. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, before we get started, I, I wanted to share a couple of, or at least one file with you that we're gonna be using. And so I'm gonna drop this worksheet in uh, the chat. Um, this is going to be something you're gonna to wanna to have up and you can type into as we, we proceed. Um, if you have any difficulty with this one, please let me know. Uh, as I start with any of my talks, if you have questions, you can use the react button. You can drop um, questions in the chat. We are gonna have some time for questions at the end as well. So. share my screen. All righty. And we're going to make sure and it, yes, it looks like we are trans doing the transcription as we go. Perfect. All right. So thank you everyone for being here with us today. Um, I have to say that, you know, public speaking, and in broadly just presenting your work, we have many challenges and many considerations that we need to make. And hopefully I'm gonna share a couple of tools that you can use that are similar to what we use when we're preparing our speakers for uh, the TEDx LSU stage. So before we get into that, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about me. Um, as Dr. Markle said, I am the uh, College of Science and College of Coast and Environment CXC coordinator. I'm an instructor for the College of Science and the Ogden Honors College. Um, I'm also the host and producer of LSU Experimental, our podcast here. And I'm also a disturbance ecologist. So I have all of my hands in these different areas and it's made me pretty, it's given me a nice experience on what to consider when we're sharing our work and research. I've worked with multiple speakers within these positions. So from students to faculty, to industry leaders, uh, from the TEDx LSU stage, all the way up to Big TED. Uh, and through those different experiences, these have allowed me to really understand and try to help others convey their ideas clearly. Um, it's given us these platforms for them to inspire others to follow their footsteps, but also these experiences have been even platforms for more questions and collaborations to occur. Um, the talks here at LSU, uh, for LSU, uh, or TEDx LSU, excuse me, um, they've garnered almost uh, 500,000 views. And so if you think about the number of views and the number of people seeing this information, it's pretty outstanding and it's a pretty incredible uh, platform. And the things that we're going to share today, I also want to tell you that I incorporate into my own classroom space. So I ask my students similar questions that we're going to go through on this worksheet and on these exercises, because I think looking at what somebody else has created can help you hone and tailor your own work. And finally, what I want to make sure I say here up at the front is that you're going to hear me talk about the TED model and Usually we're thinking this is standing on the stage, delivering an oral presentation to a group, but do know that these can apply to um, reports, publications in writing. They can uh, work for informal interactions. They can work for posters. So hopefully you can see this applying to multiple spaces. So that's a little bit about me. I also wanted to get to know a little bit about you. So um, we're gonna launch a poll. And first, I just want you to say yes or no. Have you presented before? Can everyone see that? 
Okay, there it goes. And do know, don't think about this one too much. If you've presented in class, that still counts. If you've presented at a conference, uh, that counts too. Um, and so Rob, when, uh, when it looks like almost everyone's participated, we can close it. And then if you share the results, that would be great. All right, here we go. taking a second to share. There it goes. Excellent. So we've got quite a few of you that in some capacity have done a presentation and we have some of you that have not. And for those of you that have not, no worries, you're still going to be able to garner some tools out of this that you can apply right in the near future. So now let's think about how you prepare. What are those things that you do from the moment you hear that you need to present some material in any format? Um, so we're gonna go ahead and launch poll two. And again, don't think about it too much, uh, but let's see kind of where we, where we uh, land on these four choices. Okay, so this, this is very useful too. So we have about the same amount of uh, those that are thinking about who their audience is. This is excellent. We have some that begin to draft into that Google Slides or PowerPoint or maybe even Keynotes. Um, this is good that we have uh, a group of people that are identifying the takeaway message. And you know what? I tend to fall in the bottom too. I panic and I feel overwhelmed initially, right? And so I think that these are all valid steps in which, you know, when you're given this opportunity, you're, you've got a deadline, you're going to be sharing something. We, we sometimes, it's overwhelming to figure out where do we start. But hopefully at the end of this, you're going to feel confident in following these first three, thinking about who your audience is, what, what the purpose of what you're going to do, identifying the message before you get to feeling panicked or building what you your content into slides. That building of that content in slides should be something that happens toward the end of the preparation stage. So let's talk a little bit about what a TED Talk is. So a TED Talk, um, their, their catch line is ideas worth spreading. And TED, T-E-D stands for technology, entertainment, and design. And in the initial stages, it was thought that these talks should be about 18 minutes in length coming from those thought leaders in their field from a broad range of topics all over the world, um, sharing their information, their stories, their findings, their excitements. Um, so in digestible, impactful um, style so that multiple people could learn. Now, recently those 18 minute talks have been reduced. You know, we tend to only have about uh, eight minutes of focus. So the talks have gotten shorter and in doing so, there's even more focus in on a particular point or idea. TED really, TED style really is all about making connections and allowing the listener to hear, have this information wash over them so that 
they can begin to explore a topic maybe that they've not even considered was interesting to them you know, in the past or they didn't have an opportunity to study, but to allow them to start exploring those ideas, questioning what they understand, questioning what is presented to them, and it's also a place for continual learning. There's so many TED Talks that come out um, from multiple different regions of our world that it also gives voices for those that may not be able to get on a stage as, per, as frequently as some. TED really is about sharing those ideas. It's about finding and making calls to action, and it's about inspiring others to learn. Now, I do want to say right now, because you might be thinking, there's no way I can get up and share my work in such an informal manner. And you know what? I understand that. You might be right. The style that you have to present your work in may fall within a already predetermined norm of that discipline. There's a particular way in which, you know, if I was going to the Ecological Society of America conference that say my poster needed to look, or if I was in, in engineering, how industry leaders would anticipate seeing and hearing from me. So do hear me say, I'm not saying that you need to scrap all of those discipline specific learning and, and, and presentation strategies. But what I am asking you to do is consider how you can implement some of these points. Um, and part of that really is about understanding who you're speaking to, which is your audience. So let's turn for a second onto the worksheet that I gave you. And on prompt one, what I'd like you to do is in the next minute, I want you to think about and identify who might be your audience that you're going to be speaking to. This could be for a presentation that you have upcoming. This could be for the focus of your current research. This might be just a topic that you really enjoy. But whatever it is, let's just take a minute and I want you to jot down and identify that. Okay, if you need more time, that's understandable. You're, we can, um, you can continue to think about who your audience is. So once you, so with this topic, this idea of who you're going to be um, thinking about, I want that to be your grounding person or the grounding group um, that you're considering for the rest of this presentation. So as I was saying, we need to think about who we're presenting for. We need to think about why we're presenting. And then we also need to think about who is doing the communicating. And in this case, it's going to be us. And this brings us to what's known as the rhetorical triangle. And so whenever we're doing any kind of presentation, we wanna first start here at the rhetorical triangle because it allows us to cue in on some critical pieces that help us then understand what language we can use, what types of analogies we need to incorporate, and then also what our audience is going to need so we can be, they can be engaged. And this is really, this is why this is such a vital tool. So when we look at the points of the triangle, if we start with the message, this is where you want to ask yourself, does the content you're going to share accurately convey the message you're trying to access? What do you want to share? What is that purpose and reasoning? How do you intend for it to be interpreted? Next is who's your audience. Now, your audience can be a wide range of groups. It can be very narrow, someone that's really close to your discipline, but it also can be pretty broad. So think about who that is. What's their, what are their needs? What are they going to need to have you explain? What might they already be coming to the table with? And then finally, 
Who are you as the communicator, the speaker? What are your expertise? Why should someone listen to you? When we start here with the rhetorical triangle, we identify these three components. It then allows us to proceed forward. So let's dig a little bit deeper into that message. So with the message, I really like to think about this as what is my main objective of the presentation that we are going to share? And if you've listened to some TED Talks, they're typically focused on one idea. The same thing can be said with posters, one main idea. And by doing so, it allows you to even hone in on that and then remove any of those extras. When you're thinking about the message, you also wanna think about what is your intent? So then you want to start thinking about what is that central idea, that main point, that unifying message that you're going to share, and how do you make that really crystal clear? One of the best ways um, is to start, you know, looking at all of the information, laying it out kind of like in post-its and making sure that you're putting all of those ideas that are around that central idea in one grouping and taking all of those excess ideas and placing them to the side. It's not that they're bad ideas, but they just don't belong right here. The next part of your message that you wanna consider is what is the takeaway? What is that one thing that you want to achieve? Is there a call to action? Is it, is it sharing discovery? Is it to inspire? Is it just, is it just to share science for the beauty of science? Thinking about those two pieces, your central idea, the main point, and then what you want the audience can take away can help you then navigate the creation of the rest of your, your talk. As you're doing the refining of your message, this is also the time to consider the language that you are using. And when we think about language, in STEM fields especially, we tend to use jargon. It's kind of part of our daily lives. And our core lab group knows what different acronyms mean. But if we go out into the hallway and go to the next lab, they might not know those same acronyms. So as you're building your message, you're putting together those main points, you wanna ask yourself, where can I scrub the jargon from my particular talk? You also wanna work on simplifying information and terms. This means that you're looking and asking, is there a less complex way in which I can share the same process? Please hear me say, I am not telling you to dumb things down. I actually really hate that phrase because it gives the connotation that the person or persons you're speaking to are not capable of understanding what you're delivering. What I mean by making it of simplifying terms is at thinking about where your audience is, what knowledge level they are at, and how can you give them information to where they are and then continue to inspire them to learn. Um, the other piece is, in a way that I think is nice when you're thinking about how to simplify information, is to use analogies or metaphors particularly things that are kind of the way, uh, kind of around in our daily lives. Um, when you can incorporate that to explain, say, the way um, neurons function and deliver and carry messages through the brain or, you know, invasive species and how they can spread, this gives someone some context and it's more relatable. And speaking about context, when you're sharing your graphs, you're sharing data trends, you share the context. How is this increasing or decreasing or causing more issue? By placing context and making it relatable, someone else can follow even some of the most complex of messages. And lastly is in STEM fields, we tend to really focus in on our methods. And our methodology can be very complex. We're using different instrumentation, different statistical analyses. Think about Instead of sharing those methods, can you share the process? Can you tell someone about why you took these steps? That you went to the field, that you went into the lab, that you ran a gel, but not into the nitty gritty. By backing that up and talking about the process that you took, it helps clarify the information 
for your audience at hand. The next piece is who are you as the communicator and what are your expertise? I like to call this, how are you going to establish your credibility for your audience? And so there's many different ways that you can do establish your credibility. Um, and so here we're seeing uh, Dr. Gabriela Gonzalez um, on our stage. When she walked out, she said who she was. She said her organizational affiliation and her area of research. And you can do this too, no matter what stage in your career you are, by simply saying, you know, your name, your major here at LSU, and maybe your research area you're currently interested in. It gives your audience an idea of where your base is. And it also tells them why they can come and ask you questions and listen to you. So for instance, I'm a junior in biological sciences pursuing a medical career path. We have a better idea of where you are in your study as well as what your interest is. Next is who's your audience. And we've already, we've been touching on audience throughout this piece, but audience can be multiple different types at many different levels. And you have to determine how you can connect with them. And to be quite honest, the audience part is one of my favorite things to consider because I can understand how I'm going to establish my credibility and I can have my central idea and my takeaway um, idea for my message. I can have those pretty solidified, but with my audience, this is where I can figure out what's the best platform, the best language, the best interaction I can to still convey those particular messages. So when I like to think about an audience, I like to think about them at different levels. So when I think about my small inner circle, who are those that are closest to me that are already studying similar kinds of ideas and questions and, and areas? Who are those at that inner circle that maybe I can use some of the jargon with and we can all have that nitty gritty um, discussion on particular questions and hypotheses? My middle area, my middle circle, this is the group that's a little bit broader. They still are interested, interested in STEM or they are within STEM. They may not be a disturbance ecologist, but because they are, say, a biological engineer, we have a connection and an understanding of some of those basic principles. We can have that, that conversation um, with some adjustment. And finally, your outer circle, the big piece, is that broad, diverse audience that can include anyone. It can include someone that is a peer, but they may be studying another area of work. Um, it could be uh, parents or other family. It could be different age groups. It could be politicians. It could be a person in the street in the, uh, or a person in the grocery store. By thinking about the audience that you are going to interact with, this then gives you some leverage to start thinking about what their knowledge level might be in your area and also what they might expect for you to share with them. And so in this case, you can start thinking about questions you might be able to ask them so that you can ascertain what they need to know. Um, I call these those, those they're yes or no questions you can ask someone if they understand a particular aspect of your work, and then that helps you figure out how you can navigate on the rest of your talk. But it also gives you perspective on those particular ways you're going to construct your the delivery of your presentation. Um, what analogy might work best uh, if you're working with a broad group and you're talking about maybe a process, maybe thinking about can you can you talk about how do you do hypothesis development and talk about how maybe you test whether the milk in your refrigerator is good. We usually tend to have some kind of milk product and we can make those, those relations. Now, how this goes and connects with the TED Talk is that when we are meeting with our presenters, we are asking them these particular questions. From the get-go, about six to eight months out from the date that we are going to put them on stage, we are asking them to start thinking about what is the central message and takeaway message of their talk. 
And by having them starting at the beginning, at the get-go to focus in means that we can work and remove the minutia and remove the excess. We can keep them focused and in their lane. We also get them very early on to start thinking about their credibility. We ask who they are, what they've been doing. And those pieces of credibility go into bios. They go into what they might say when they walk out on stage. It goes into little blurbs. It goes into any of the promotion. And it also gives those that are gonna view them reason to why these are our experts. Our speakers usually have some form of a hook in their, um, in their talk. And a hook is something that gains the viewer's attention and so that they remain engaged. It can be multiple things. It can be a question. It can be a shocking statement. It can be something that resonates with that other, the listener. It can be an emotional connection. Whatever that hook is, we start to think about how we can get the buy-in so that someone realizes that what is being shared, they, there's an investment and they, have, they are invested in this particular talk. And again, kind of we also work on clear language. We think about analogies and those metaphors that they can use. We also make sure that all of these talks have a call to action. And sometimes that call to action happens at the very beginning. Um, where we're pretty upfront with our, um, our audience and saying, this is what we want you to do. This is what we hope to inspire you to proceed to investigate. So let's see how this all works. What I'd like to do is I'm going to share with you, um, a sh it's, I'm gonna, not gonna lie, it's not short, it's about three minutes, um, but I want us to turn to that worksheet. I want you to look at part two. Part two is asking specific questions about Dr. Emma Schrackner and how she establishes her credibility, what is her message, and how she makes those connections with you as an audience. I want you to jot down some of those pieces um, and oh, also how she removes any jargon from her talk. Um, we're gonna listen to that briefly and then we'll come back and I'm gonna want to hear from you. What did you notice? Um, what was shocking? What were your first impressions? Okay. So um, this is where I want to um, give us an opportunity to talk about these pieces that we just saw. Um, what were some of your first impressions? I can go. Hi, Mia. Um, I like that even though she was talking about something that seemed at first like it was going to be really confusing and complex, she kind of brought everything down to a level of like basic understanding and used really good explanations or like analogies to explain everything. So even though she was talking about something that like I've never studied or I've never learned about, I felt like I understood what she was saying. Thank you. What are some other so we've, we've heard, you know, this, this clarification of this complex, this complex topic and brought it into terms that the audience in that space, as well as the broader audience globally can, it can, it can handle. What are some other things that we noticed? Um, three. Um, I can go. Hi, Lauren. Um, Another thing I noticed was whenever she was trying to bring it back to something that everybody would relate to, she mentioned her dog and she started it off with imagine the ribcage of a dog. And she went back to the early example about how there was very little oxygen levels and how the dinosaurs would have needed the lung capacity for that. And I feel like that was how she brought it back to that topic with a good analogy. I agree. I think that, you know, she's, she's thinking about what was a relatable organism that we have now um, that could demystify organisms and creatures that we are only really seeing, you know, what, either in a museum or we're seeing pictures or, or we're seeing in Jurassic Park, we're seeing some, uh, 
dramaticization of those pieces. What were some other, what were some ways that you noticed um, that Emma shared her expertise, her credentials? she studies comparative anatomy so she specifically started talking about how she researches the specialized lung functions which help the dinosaurs succeed you could also tell that she was really excited and full of energy so she could be trusted because she was confident in her ability to express that message thank you ricky so right you know she went and she she gave you know where she is who she is what she does but also Ricky, you're highlighting some of those interpersonal uh, communication skills, those, those um, I almost want some nonverbals, if you will, you know, how she was standing and she let her authentic excitement for that topic really shine through. And if there's anything that really helps someone become engaged is if you share your excitement about something, it's almost difficult for others not to get as excited. When you listen to that, what were, um, what were some of the takeaways you might have had for how she removed some of the jargon from her talk? I can go again. I had something specific that I wrote down. Sure. Um, when she was talking about kind of like connecting all of the different species, species, she used words like, oh, they're like cousins or things like that, instead of using these like big medical or like biological terms that people probably wouldn't have understood or using like nomenclature. I don't know what all of that is. But anyway, she basically kind of like put it down on a level like saying that they were like cousins or using phrases like that that people understood, which seemed to help. Thank you, Mia. So yeah, again, um, what might be familiar to a broad range of individuals in your, in your space? Um, what might be some concerns with doing this type of presentation, particularly in our, our STEM fields? Does this do justice to the research or does it potentially confuse some of the information? because if you were talking to other professionals in the field, they might feel like you were dumbing it down and taking away from the research. But to the general public, they would feel included and excited that you were sharing this information with them at a level they could understand and appreciate. Yes, so here is again, where we wanna think about who is the audience that we are speaking to. And I can tell you when uh, Emma and I were working on this talk, this was something to where we were constantly asking, what is the most accurate way that keeps it within the understanding and knowledge level of this broad audience without doing a disservice to those that are in the particular field. And so do know that there's not always a perfect way, there's going to be some of those battles. The other thing that I'm going to share with you right now is that this was scripted. So, in STEM, sometimes when we go to do a presentation, we kind of do it off the cuff. We've got our slides, we know what we need to say. TEDx and TED Talks are typically scripted. Now this doesn't mean that the presenter memorizes the information, but rather they internalize it. And what I mean by that is that they understand that information so deeply and they've practiced it so much that they can use some visual cues or they can use, they, they have an idea of what they need to say so that they can continue on with that information and that message. Um, I like to highlight that because it's not memorizing, but it is really kind of thinking about, okay, I'm going to just go and tell the story. And I've told this story so many times that I can just share it. Um, so what I'd like to do now uh, we're going to do this kind of just kind of uh, briefly is I want to give you the opportunity 
to I want to give you the opportunity to jot down some of your own place within these ideas. So what I'd like you to do is to turn to the worksheet and I want you to take a few moments. Um, we're just going to take maybe, let's take two minutes. I'd like you to take two minutes and I want you to try to answer at least how you are credible. And I want you to go to number three, part three, and I want you to identify why is your topic area, your research or your work, why is it significant? Why is it important? So individually, I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes and then I'm gonna, we're gonna break you into some small groups and you're gonna share with each other those, those interactions. And Rob, if you don't mind, would you go ahead and open up our breakout rooms? We're gonna do these kind of quickly. I wanna give you about, um, about three-ish three minutes in those spaces to chat about your answers to those two parts. Share with each other your credibility, give each other some feedback on um, how you might improve, how you address your credibility and then I want you to talk a little bit about why your work is significant. All righty, welcome back everyone. So I know the thought was a pretty fast uh, breakout, um, but I wanted to have this opportunity to kind of hear what were some of the ways which I knew yourself or you heard your partner share their credibility that you are inspired to use. Uh, I can go. Uh, so, for example, Caroline basically told me I was in a kind of a funk about it because I'm like, hey, I'm in a research lab doing something that is kind of related to my major, but kind of not. But the the woman that I'm working with, my research mentor, is so highly respected. And so just understanding how what I'm doing and my connection to her and how I'm helping in her lab and making those uh, like correlations as an undergrad research assistant can be so vital into what we're doing. So even though I, I can't be like, well, I have X degree, I can say, well, I'm currently working in order to get this degree and I'm working with this person and showing how what I do and her work coincide together and showing how I can be credible as I have made the connection with somebody who does have such a profound standing at this at this campus. You know, I'm so glad you brought that point up. Um, that's when we're, we can talk about transferable skills. The fact that you as an undergraduate are participating in undergraduate research in addition to getting your degree and taking those classes. And if you have a job outside of this, right? You're having to manage all of those times and those responsibilities. And that to me speaks volumes for you as a person, you, uh, your dedication and your motivation. I also think that sometimes we do need to back up and think about what those connections can be and how they could relate to the future. So while your major and the undergraduate degree program you're currently in may not seem connected, there are connections. Um, I like to call those those gray dashed lines. Um, and so maybe you know that's where you're learning how to do appropriate research how to maybe interact with others. You're learning about another system and I'm sure you're gonna figure out those connections. Thank you for sharing. 
what was another um, kind of epiphany or, or even struggle for establishing your credibility? Um, I can go. So I think that one um, kind of issue that I had when writing mine is that I've done a very like wide variety of things, whether it's like multiple labs that I've worked in or like um, I have like a major and a minor. And so I think for me, it was trying to establish which of the experience that I experiences that I've done are the most relevant to mm-hmm. like the experience. So I for my first part, I had talked about Um, that it was my honors thesis proposal that I was talking about that was my audience and so for me it was trying to figure out which of the experiences that I've done were the most relevant to that because I don't want to talk about like you know my sociology minor when talking about my thesis proposal for a um, like behavioral neuroscience project so for me it was talking trying to figure out and narrowing down which experiences were the most relevant to what I was actually presenting on. And so that, that again, is another interesting piece is thinking about who your audience is first, what out of your expertise speaks to them and which hat you need to wear. And so, you know, when I'm in this kind of place, I want to lead with my instructor, my communication intensive work. I want to lead with being a TEDx speaker coach. Those are the pieces I want to lead with. But I also want to include the fact that, you know, I am a scientist by training. And so you've got to figure out how you prioritize those pieces. I will tell you, you know, I I haven't brought up, you know, like, oh, I'm a mom, I have cats. That's kind of outside of that realm, right? I used to work in a restaurant. Those are outside. People don't need to know that. But what you did say was that, you know, you've got the honors thesis and you have a minor there's some relation there. And so don't discount the minor as not holding weight or value within that space. That could be something that comes out. And perhaps it's something that because you have that minor, that also helps you look at your research from other perspectives and angles. Did we have any struggles with this exercise in particular? So if you did, know that that's normal. Um, I, I want to reiterate for you, and I actually wrote it down really in big lettering on my notepad beside me. I want you to know that for some of our, our speakers to develop their talks, we start working with them between six and eight months in advance before they hit the stage. And the organizers of TEDxLSU are actually starting anywhere from 10 to 12 months out, sometimes more, vetting and thinking about who should be on the stage. So this is a long process and it does take a while to kind of really become comfortable. And there's some things that you can do. So in the last couple minutes, I do wanna share just a few things. And then I I really do wanna open it up for any questions that you may have, Um, is this last little slide here. And that is, you know, these to me are the big pieces of a TED talk is, you know, no matter what you're presenting or who you're presenting to, one, remember what your goals are for that particular talk, consider the norms of your discipline. And if you have an opportunity to utilize some of this skill set, I want you to think about who you're going to be speaking to what their needs are and how you can meet them where they are, how you can engage them. And also, is there something maybe you want from your audience? Is there collaboration opportunities you want? The things I've shared with you today can be applied to elevator pitches as well. Remember to keep things in balance. So don't add too much ingredients to a particular uh, a presentation, but really focus in and highlight on that one piece, make it the star and the lasting piece that resonates. Um, Use context, place things in context. If you're gonna, you're gonna use data trends, you're gonna put that type of information up on your presentation, give somebody something to relate it to. 
uh, for me, I was always measuring fire intensity and severity. And so I needed to first establish what was something, what was the average temperature and what was an increase, what was hotter and what was cooler. And by doing that, it provided someone some ideas of understanding the rest. Provide spoilers. So you can be upfront and transparent uh, when you're sharing your work on either an end result that you got or a call to action that you want them to make. And the final two are the internalization, not memorization, and practice. So from the very beginning, even if you're trying to figure out what's going to be my main point, I'm so confused, start talking it out. We all tend to have some kind of device that we can use to record us. We all have access to Zoom. Turn Zoom on, mute your, um, your camera, and talk into Zoom. And just allow that free throw, that free flow of thought to come out and be captured and then re-listen to it because you might have some nuggets that are really great. Some might have to be scrapped. I personally am big on writing a lot of notes. So I have lots of pieces of paper. I have a notebook and I just write my stuff down. But then I also talk out my presentations, no matter what the platform, while I'm cooking, while I'm driving, et cetera, while I'm exercising, because it not only helps me solidify what I need to say in my mind, but it also makes me comfortable with that story. Um, and think about that content before you even approach visuals. Uh, I really encourage you not to open up your slide deck um, software until you've got a nice um, outline. And lastly, don't, don't feel bad if you have to scrap things. Sometimes we have to trim or change or move things around in order to make what you're going to share perfect. And just as an example, Emma's talk, um, that was multiple months. And I want to say that was probably, we were meeting at least once a week for anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours, revising that script, that script completely transformed. Do not be afraid to transform what you're going to share and share it with others because they can help you. And so with that, I want to open it up for questions. I also am going to if you are interested, I want to drop Emma's talk in the chat if you're interested in learning more about the dinosaurs and how they were breathing. Um, you have access to that too. Know that if you click on that link, it will probably start playing for you. So with that, um, what kind of questions can I answer for you today? Just real quick before we take questions, I'm going to drop a an evaluation form in the chat. Um, if you could go to that link and fill the form out, we'd really appreciate your feedback about this talk. All right. Um, any questions for Dr. Carmichael? Dr. Carmichael, you've given a flawless presentation. No, no questions. Well, if you have questions, I'm gonna, I'll put my email here in the chat. Um, you can reach out to me. Um, I tell everyone this, my students included, if you send me an email and you don't get a response back between 24 and 48 hours, please send me a, a reminder. I, I don't intend to miss those emails. Sometimes they just get buried. Um, and so I'm available if you want to chat. Um, 
We also have services through CXC that can help with presentations. Um, and I will also place that here. Um, this is everything uh, across all disciplines. Oh, I gotta move my chat window there. Um, so we have different studio spaces. Right now our studio spaces, some are open um, or by appointment, but we also do appointments uh, synchronously uh, through Zoom, and that's right now on writing and speaking our mentors that assist you are trained across disciplines and genres to help with any kind of project you might have. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, we will be uh, posting this talk on our YouTube channel. It'll probably go up sometime next week. And um, I will email everyone who registered to, to let you all know when that is available. Thank you all so much. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you spending our, our, your, your Friday afternoon with us. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Carmichael. We really appreciate the talk. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. All right, bye-bye everyone. Have a good weekend. Thank you. I really enjoyed this presentation. So thank you for taking the time to do it. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Uh, thanks for Thank your call. You Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Carmichael, for the presentation. It was really helpful. I took lots of notes. <laughs> Glad to hear. And I should say that the, the worksheet I gave you, there were some other places that we didn't cover. And that was for you all. You could use those for later. So make copies of the, the worksheet. Use it for other presentations, not just for this, for this talk. Bye, y'all. All right. Bye-bye, everyone.